pray with me. God, from the beginning, you were the word. You sent your only son to save us all, and he even allowed himself to be tortured and crucified to obey you. Bless us with the gift of understanding of, and of the unshaken faith in you. Let us know the meaning of your words in the Bible and how to live accordingly. Open the door of our hearts and fill us with your light and understanding. Amen. The first scripture reading is from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint. And you, strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. From Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, and the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but do but to do justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you, Shani. Thank you, Wendy. Um, thank you, Tom and Barbara. Um, our second scripture passage comes to us um, in this season of Pentecost, right after the Pentecost story, at the end of the book, uh, the second chapter of the book of Acts. So listen now to the word of the Lord. They, the disciples and those who had converted, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For you are our, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're still on, uh, on the men, but need some cough drops. Forgive me. Um, so I want to tell a story about when I was as a student intern, which is kind of like when I was a student teacher at a big church down in Pittsburgh. I was blessed to be at this big church in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, and they decided that my task for the year that I was working for them, was to try to get a ministry to 20s and 30-somethings off the ground. Because that was the area that they felt that maybe my gifts and talents could meet, and that they were lacking. And so we started this Bible study, and about six to ten people started attending. And we were a motley crew. Um, many of us were poor students, right? I was a seminary student, and there was a PhD student in theology at Duquesne, and a someone who had just finished her speech therapy degree and someone else who maybe she just hung out with us in school too much and decided to go back to get her nurse anesthetist um, degree. So there were just a bunch of us that gathered on a weekly basis to study the Bible and be together. And I remember one day, a young man was, was telling us, as we were talking about what's going on in our lives, that, that he was having a hard time financially. And he was struggling to pay his bill, even getting groceries. And I tell this story because I have nothing to do with this. I love these kind of stories. A guy next to me takes off his hat, opens his wallet, sticks some money in it, and passes it around the table. And one by one, we each are like, okay. All of us, many of us, are, are either starting off our, on our careers or poor students. But, and so none of us would have thought that we could have made a difference. But together, we put money in the hat. And that young man made his bills and had food that week. And to be completely honest, I forgot about that story until about two or three years later, I ran into one of the young men, not the young man who received the hat full of money and not the man who started the hat going, who said, I wasn't sure if this church was for me. I wasn't sure if this group was for me. He only attended one or two times. And at that moment, he said, this is the church for me. And he stayed. He stayed. He got involved in leadership. He eventually joined the church, became an elder. He married a young woman from that group. He stayed because he saw the church radically taking care of each other in this moment of this young man taking off his hat and opening his wallet. We in the world. At our best, we, we are not always perfect. We're not gonna even pretend that we're perfect. But at our best, we are called to be different than the world. That we value people over profits, right? I recently had the pleasure of reading, and when I say reading, I should qualify saying I listened to it, so I might need to, to go again. A small book by a man named Walter Brueggemann. He's an expert in the Old Testament. And Walter Brueggemann wrote this book about Sabbath as an act of, I don't remember the name, but an act of defiance against the world of consumption or something to that effect. And Brueggemann talks about how the transition that happened from the the people in Egypt as slaves and how they moved into freedom. And the story that, uh, that, that Shani read for us talks about God bringing the people out of Egypt into freedom and talks about the people who did that, Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And what he says is that in Egypt, the world was a, 
was a world of pyramids, and not just the pyramids that the Israelites um, built, but the people at the top were the only ones that mattered. The Pharaoh, the priests of Pharaoh, the rich people, the powerful people. And everything else was there to serve the people at the top. And when they came out of Egypt, God set a holy system in place. In Egypt, there were no neighbors. You were either powerful or working to keep the powerful happy. And that was it, according to Brueggemann. But when they came out of Egypt, God set up a new system where it didn't matter if you were a widow, an orphan, or an immigrant, because there were all of those in that group. There were people from Egypt that joined the Israelites and went into the desert with them. Or if you were a priest, a Levite, a rich person, whoever. It didn't matter. We were all neighbors. And that Ten Commandments that we are given is the beginning of God saying, this is how we ought to treat God and one another, because we are no longer in a pyramid scheme. We are neighbors, and we're all equal. We are all created in the image of God. And the linchpin for that is in the midst of the Ten Commandments, God says that we are no longer slaves in Egypt, so we are allowed to rest. Right? We are neighbors, and we are not to um, use other people. We are to treat others with this neighborly, loving one another. What we find in the story that Shane read for us is that the people of Israel have had the freedom and they've reached the promised land and they've started to build up this beautiful culture and this beautiful society. But guess what? They have reverted back to Egypt and they have made a pyramid again. And they have used a system that puts down the poor, takes advantage of the poor, does not take care of the immigrant, does not take care of the widow and orphan, and God is sick of it. He has this courtroom scene that Shane read for us. What does the Lord require for you? God is acting as the judge as well as the lawyer in this, in this um, text that Shane read for us. And God is trying to bring the people back to those Ten Commandments, to that idea that we are neighbors, that we don't live in a pyramid where the powerful get rich and richer and the rest of us are just peons, but that we are together different kind of community. That is what God is calling the people in, in Egypt time, in Micah's time, in the church, in Acts, and today. That we are not to worry about ourselves or about holding up the power structure, but we are called in what's called egalitarian, in equalizing ministry, where we get to treat one another regardless of what the world says our status is, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Pope um, Francis, the current Pope of the Catholic Church, um, has said that the church does not grow by proselytizing, but by attraction. That is not to say that words don't matter. At some point, we do have to say the words of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in our lives. But what I think he's saying is, is that if our words don't match up with the way that we act towards one another and towards the world, it becomes disingenuous. Um, there is even a book on my shelf that says they love Jesus, but they hate the church. And it's a book about why people in our culture are leaving the church. Not our church, but just in general. Because they see people saying one thing and doing another. We are called to be a church like the Church of Acts. And let's be clear, the Church of Acts was not perfect. Let's not idealize it. They're, they get problems very quickly on. Just keep, we just read chapter 2. Just read a little bit more and you'll find some of the problems that they have. But they are trying to live into this new kind of community that they are to be about. We have been, as a church, spending time in um, what does it mean to be a church and a group of people that are listening for the Holy Spirit that are seeking experiences with God that will transform our lives and the world around us. Those are lives. And maybe comforts us if we need some comfort, and maybe discomforts us if we need to get out of our own comfort zone. And then we talked about abiding in Christ. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And we do that through prayer. And so we were challenged to have some experiments with prayer as we try to abide in God. 
And last week we talked about that's not just about us as individuals, but it's a yins or a y'all concept in the Bible. We are the people of God. And so that book of Acts is about a bunch of individual beloved community that we are called to be. And so it's not just about praying for our own spiritual growth, but praying for our church to be that beloved community. So we're called to be a spirit-led church, a spirit-driven church. We have great things and great skills, let's be clear. But this, the fruits of the spirit that are talked about, whether we talk about um, the mercy and justice and loving God that Shane read about, or what Paul talks about in the New Testament, patience and peace and self-control, gentleness, all of those um, fruits of the spirit, they don't come by muscling under and trying harder. They come through waiting on the spirit and praying. We are trying, and it's hard in this fast-paced world, we are trying to slow down. Dare I say that idea from Brueggemann, we are trying to rest and trust that God is doing something in this place through this group of people. And so we are called to be a church that is not muscling through trying harder, being better, but a church that people experience God. God's love, God's grace, God's mercy. And so how do we do that? Some of the things are already being done. One of the biggest comments that I get, biggest comments I get from people that I know that are coming here for whatever reason, whether guest ministers or people who are visiting because they're my friends or family, this is one of the friendliest churches they've ever seen. And let me be clear, that's huge. These are not people who have never been to a church and don't know what to expect. They know what church is and they feel welcome here. I have been that person that has walked into churches, sat down and no one talked to me. As an introvert, it's not the worst thing in the world, but that will not happen here. And that's a good thing. We are a church that is a praying church, and people know that and ask for their needs, their friends, their concerns to be called into our prayer list. That's huge. We are a church, I have said this before and I will say it again, I call us a purple church. We have people who vote red, and we have people who vote blue. And we talk to each other, and we love each other, and we're not willing to just not talk about politics and still love each other. That's huge. My friends that I talk to either have a church that is all one or all the other, or they don't talk about politics. That's off limits. And I firmly believe what makes us stronger is that by knowing someone on the opposite side of the spectrum, we can't dehumanize people who disagree with us. And so, that's one of our strengths. One of our strengths is when we know a need, we rise up. Whether it's, I, I, I heard the stories of the roots that we needed to put on, but also the family with a child with cancer, the person who's sick and meals are delivered, the person who has just lost a spouse and I'm there and the first person there is one of you. When we know a need, we're there. It does require a level of vulnerability to be willing to let people know that there's something wrong and be willing to accept help. Because we can't always be the helpers, sometimes we have to be the receivers. We want to be a church that people feel God's presence. We want to dig into these strengths. We want to let our roots grow deep. So the session is trying to take very seriously some of these things. So I want you to think about how we can continue to be a spirit-led church. We take very seriously that we like being around the table with each other. And so the session has planned meals, one a month for the next, starting in July. We're going to have a, a supper as we welcome some mission coworkers here to tell us about their mission in Sudan. And then we're going to have a, a table fellowship where we get to eat with them and eat with each other. And we're going to have something every month. We're hoping we're, we've got in the works every month, a, a, a family meal for our church family every month through December. 
because we value being together. And the challenge is, when you hear about it, mark your calendar. Come. When you hear about it, invite somebody that might like a meal. Some of those meals will be right after church, and some of them will be in the afternoon or evening. So if someone's not comfortable with church, they can still come to the meal. Invite a friend, and here's the kicker. The third challenge is sit with someone you don't normally sit with. We are creatures of habit. Anybody that wants to sit in the chaos of the Greek bomb table, you are welcome. <laughs> sit with someone that you don't know. Or don't know as well. For some of you, that's going to be a little harder than others. Some other things that are going on. Jim and Paul told you about the ways that we are trying to steward our building. We are doing this because we believe that there is still life here. We still believe that there is hope. We still believe that God is up to stuff here. And so we want to take care of our building, take care of our boilers, so that we can live into the next generation of what God is calling us to be and do here in this place. And so how might God be calling you to participate? To participate in the cleanup? To participate in the, in the boiler campaign? How might God be calling you um, to give up yourself in this season? Third challenge. I hear over and over again that there are people in the pews that are missing. They got out of the habit during, um, during the pandemic or they got hurt by someone, or something else happened and we don't know. And it's great that I reach out, and I do, but I wanna challenge you. Who are you missing? Who don't you notice in the pews anymore? Who might benefit from a call or a card or a text, a kindly worded invite? We're not here to guilt people, but you're here, I'm hoping, because you believe this matters and that you sense God's presence, and you want to invite people into that. And the fourth challenge is, who do you know that might not have a church family? You don't have to have the perfect words of who Jesus is, but Jesus matters to you. And so how do we invite other people into that experience of Jesus that we are having here? The final challenge, how do we be a spirit-led church? <laughs> The final challenge is to continue praying. Pray for your elders. Pray for your pastor. I know that sounds selfish. Pray for your elders. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your prayer bear. Pray, pray for your shut-ins. Pray. As you drive by this place, pray. If you're one of the people that's volunteering and, and helping in Lee's absence and you're vacuuming, pray. As you sing, pray. Pray for our church. Not that it would be glorified, but that God would be glorified in this place. As we seek to be a, uh, a spirit-led church, we are called one of the six great ends of the church is that we are the outcropping of the kingdom of God here on earth. That is who we are. God created that different kind of community, community as the people left Egypt. God is fighting for it in the, in the text of Micah. The disciples are leaning into it in Acts, and we are called to do the same. We are the kingdom of God, the, the um, consulate. We are the consulate of God's kingdom here on earth. Right? Jesus said that the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus said that we were to pray, Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the ways that we love other people, and the ways that we invite other people into our loving community, and the ways that we stay connected to God's spirit through prayer, will make us more and more the spirit-driven church. Not our own strength and power and muscle, but the Holy Spirit blowing through this place. I know sometimes you might think that things happen by accident, but like those songs that we pick, Holy Spirit, You Are Welcome Here has been played for the last month in some way, right? How do we be people who are so radically different than the world, and more importantly, what our God is up to? Will you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for the many ways that you have blessed us. 
We thank you for the generosity of so many who step up and care for those needs that we know about. We thank you for the vulnerability of people who are willing to share and willing to let their needs be known so that we may pray and we may help. Thank you, God, for the ways that we welcome the stranger, that we're willing to talk about hard things. Lord God, we want more of your grace in our lives, more of your spirit. So help us to, to be people that continue to value prayer and connection with you. Help us to listen to your spirit. Help us to be people of audacious hope. Help us to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with you. And we pray this all not so that we, our church will survive or thrive or be the best in town, but so that your name will be proclaimed in word and deed in this place for your sake, for your kingdom come. We pray this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia and amen.
Go by way of the parlor so that you may get pie and celebrate with your family of faith. Go and serve the Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.